Amen. Well, good morning. Good to have you here at this latter service. We want to welcome those viewing online. Appreciate you joining us today. Well, it's the last Sunday of the year. It's also the last Sunday of this decade. So aren't you glad you have chosen to be in church today? Everybody not here. Everybody didn't come to church today. They won't be able to say, I went to church on the last day of this past decade. So I'm glad you're here. And usually we we use this service or this time. We we like to talk about letting go of all the things in the the past and everything uh, that has happened. We want to let it go so we can accept the new things that God has for us in the new year. And certainly there's a place for that. And we'll get into some of that in the next couple of weeks. But today, I've got a special message. Uh, just I just want to hit a few principles that I think is very, very important in order for us to take on the new year. I think it's very important how we finish this year. And so I want to give you one verse of scripture to open up and then we will, we will kind of shift around today. But uh, one verse, that being from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 3. Verse 3, and this has to do with the restoration that God offers to uh, our people. The restoration is a theme that you see throughout the entire Bible. That is... Uh, To going back and uh, receiving what has been lost. And restoring what God has done. Many times you see God take take a life. And uh, do some tremendous things in that person's life. And it seems like the world or the enemy takes it away. Well, our God's a God of restoration. He is a God that welcomes to give those things back to us. And so uh, we see this principle very early in the Bible, in the law. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 3, it simply says this. The Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Hey, before we pray, I, I I want to ask you to do something. I want to ask when I pray, I want you to pray. And here's what I want you to pray. I want you to pray and ask God to speak to you this morning. You know, many times I just feel we just come to church. It's just a habit. I mean, we really, and we, we don't expect to get anything out of it. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray earnestly for God to speak to you. And I want you to do something else. I want you to look to the right or to the left, see who's beside you. And I want you to pray for them. Because here's what I know. Some of you perhaps are sitting here and you were drugged to church. You really don't give a rat's about being here. Amen? That's just the truth. We live, in, we live in a society. That's just how it works. Some people could care less about sitting here. You've had a family member or you've had a friend that has drugged you here. And so you really, you aren't going to pray. That those people aren't going to pray for God to speak to them because they don't really want God to speak to them anyway. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray for the person to your right and to your left just in case you're sitting by one of those people that really don't care about being here. But it's my prayer that God has his way in this service today. Hey, this is going to be a short message. It's not going to take me long to preach it, but it's a very important message. The first first, uh, crowd in the first service, they thought I've went through some transformation. It was so short. It's going to be short today. You're going to be able to beat the Baptist to the buffet this morning. All right? It's going to be short, but I want you to pray. I want you to pray for God to have his way this morning. Pray with me. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here in your house to worship you and to praise you. Lord, you're so good to us. Lord, if we're breathing... It's a testimony that your grace has been sufficient enough to leave us here on this earth this long. Lord, you obviously have a plan and a purpose for every individual sitting here and every individual listening to my voice today. I ask that you have your way. Lord, I know that there's nothing within me that can meet any need that's here today. 
I can't preach. I can't say anything with any significance. Unless you anoint these words. Unless you help me. And so Lord I pray that you do that today. May this message not fall on deaf ears. But may it bring glory and honor to your name. Help us all to be attentive and receptive to what you have to say. And we'll be careful to praise you. And everyone said, Amen. Years ago, I had worked late up here at the church one night. And I was trying to meet a deadline that I had with the denomination concerning some work that they wanted me to do. And and so I was uh, writing and uh, trying to finish up and meet that deadline. And it was a little after midnight. I left here and I drove home and when I pulled in my driveway I was greeted by two men that was running out of Brandy's vehicle my wife's vehicle they obviously were in there uh, taking some things and uh, and so as soon as I pulled in they went running out of the vehicle diving into my backyard and never to be found again and the very next day We installed a high security system, a very high quality security system, and I acquired a killer German Shepherd. And uh, and that's still, uh, we still have those things in place today. It was a reaction to a fear and anger towards the possibility of someone stealing from me, taking what I have for their own benefit. We live in a society in which we all have a growing concern with theft. That is people stiffing us or robbing us of things that are not theirs. We have alarm systems, surveillance systems. We have multiple locks on our doors and guns in our homes to address this reality of theft. Unauthorized intrusion into our home or property with the sole purpose of taking what belongs to us. Unfortunately, theft is something that we all have to be aware of. We all have to take it seriously because no one wants to be robbed. No one wants to have things taken from them. Now, theft occurs in many forms, right? I mean, there's identity theft, there's... uh, Car theft, there's uh, uh, material theft. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of theft these days. And you say, how, how rampant is it? Well, about every 10 seconds, something's stolen or multiple things are stolen in our world. So it's a, it's a continuous thing that we face. But I've come to tell you this morning, I want us to focus on a particular kind of theft. The theft that I want to address has nothing to do with the physical realm, but with the spiritual realm. You see, just as we have thieves that come to take our personal belongings, there's also a thief that comes to take things from us that belong to us spiritually. Things that only God can give us. Ephesians 1.3, this is what it says. Praise be to the God... And father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has blessed us in the heavenly realms. With every spiritual blessing in Christ. So it's God's plan. It's God's desire to bless his children. It's God's desire for for him to give us things. He desires to protect us. To take care of us. To give us spiritual blessings that cannot be found in this world. True joy. True love. True happiness. Peace that passes all understanding. Faith that can move mountains. Courage that can break the cycles of anxiety and depression. Strength that can break the chains of addiction and bad habits. Kindness that can help us get along with even the most annoying people. Amen. These are things that only come from God. Patience to help us to control our anger and our temper and our tongue. But here's the problem. John 10.10 says this. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. You see, for many of us, the enemy has stolen our joy. 
So happiness eludes us. For others, the enemy has stolen peace. So we live in chaos. For some, the enemy has stolen relationships. So we have no harmony in our life. For some of us, the enemy has stolen opportunities, doors that should have been open, but fear and and dread and doubt has caused those doors to be shut because we chose not to move forward in faith and missed out on those opportunities. The enemy has stolen some people's health. The weight of this world has caused so much grief that it has caused us to overlook our health and to let ourselves go. For some, the enemy has stolen success or prosperity. I'm talking about resources, gifts, or achievements that have been given to you by God. But due to your lack of management or stewardship, those things have been taken away. Church, listen to me. It'll be a sad day in your life when you get to a point where you think of yourself as an owner of everything that you have. Listen, everything belongs to God, ladies and gentlemen. And all the blessings, all the gifts, all the resources, everything that God has given you when, you. when you get to that point where you're no longer a manager of those things. And you begin to take ownership in all that. And you decide where it goes and how it's dispersed. Watch out. Watch out. Because he's the owner. We're just the managers. We're just the managers. Some people have had their identity stolen. They don't know if they're male or female or somewhere in between. This world has ripped their identity away and they don't really understand who they are anymore. For some, the enemy has stolen their life. They no longer have any value of life. And suicide has become a part of their thought process. Because they've become so miserable that they all have almost decided in their heart that death is better than life. These people have been ripped off and they no longer enjoy life or are fulfilled in this life. Because what God has once given them has been stolen, has been taken away. Now there are times in our lives that this world and the enemy have their way with us. After all, we do live in a fallen world. But it is my evaluation that most of the time things that Satan has stolen from us have been given to him. With our permission. Or we have relinquished what we once had. Or we have gone down a road of trying to trade what we have in God. For what we think the world can give us. At any rate the Bible gives us two very important principles concerning how to get it back. Because our God is a God of restoration. He does desire to give you back what you've lost. But let me, let me share just a few things. Joel 2, 12 through 13, this is what it says, or through 14. It says, even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. Grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. And then if you go to 2 Kings chapter 8 verse 3 it says at the end of the seven years she came back from the land of the Philistines and went to appeal to the king for her house and land. The king asked the woman about it and she told him. Then he assigned an official to her case and said to him, Give back everything that belonged to her, including all the income from her land from the day she left the country until now. It's in verse 6. So here you see this lady, had she'd gone. She left everything for seven years. She left um, her home. She, she lost her house, uh, her land. And so she comes back and the king is so gracious. He says, give it all back to her. Give it all back to her. And not only that, but he's so gracious. He says, you even give her all the proceeds and the increase that her land has had since she's been gone. She left and comes back and gets more than she had. How would you like that to happen, huh? Go on a vacation, come back and, get, and have more than 
what you had when you left be a pretty good deal. I just want to share with you two simple principles this morning that will help you get back on track. Many of you need to understand this principle and apply it to your life before this year ends. Listen to me. You say, well, I've got some things I'm looking for. I've got some, uh, some resolutions. I've got some things I want to change. Hey, forget all that right now. This needs to happen before you go in to 2020 with any expectations, with any uh, understanding of taking on some new things and that God has for you. This needs to happen in your life. Let me give you two principles and then I'm done. Number one is this. When you leave something, you lose something. When you leave something, you lose something. Church, if you've got leaving on your mind, you've got losing in your future. If you've got leaving on your mind, you've got losing on your future. Listen, you cannot leave something and not lose something. You cannot walk away from something and not lose something. Hey, this even happens in general life. You can't leave a company with all kinds of benefits and take those benefits with you when you leave, can you? No, no, no. When you leave the company, you lose the benefits. You, you can't take on a new diet and a new exercise program and everything go well and you're, you're beginning to see benefits and beginning to wear tighter clothes so people can see it and, and you're getting all excited on how you look. And, and You can't stop dieting and stop exercising and take all those benefits with you, can you? No, no, no. It's funny, you, you can tell when somebody's dieting and exercising. exercise, just look at what they wear. <laughs> hey, we like to show it off, don't we? Huh? When we in the gym, we want everybody to know it, amen? Hey, you, you, you can't take, you lose those benefits when you stop dieting, when you stop exercising. Hey, when you leave a relationship, you lose the benefits of that particular relationship. When, when you leave certain things, hey, companies even see this in their decline. You see some companies that take off and that have all this success. And, and then all, if you watch their decline, all you have to do is, is see some principles that they've lost along the way. Like customer service isn't what it used to be. Like uh, people skills. The people who are working don't have people skills anymore. And as a result, the company loses some things because they've left some key principles in their organization. The same applies in our spiritual life. When you leave the church, you leave the benefits of fellowship. When you leave your private time with God, you lose some benefits. When you leave your prayer life behind, you lose the benefits. When you leave your stewardship behind. When you stop giving properly. You, you lose the benefits that come with that. When you leave your worship behind. You lose some benefits. When you leave humility. You leave your character and your integrity behind. As a society we've left morality and as a result, we've lost decency and purity. We've left modesty. And as a result, we've lost our dignity. We've left holiness behind. And as a result, we've, let, we've lost godliness. We've left the presence of the Holy Spirit. And as a result, we've lost His power. Church, I'd like us to get back to believing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? I'd like to get back to trusting that God can do big things. That trusting God can, can, can overcome the things of this world. The modern church has lost miracles. We've lost radical faith. We've lost freedom in worship. All because we've left the message of the power of the Holy Spirit. Many of us have left our prayer life. Church, do you have a prayer life? Think about it. I know you have an internet life. I know you have a Facebook life. Come on now. 
I, I, know, I know you got a sports life. But, but do you have a prayer life? Do you have a church life? Many of us have left the church for the travel life. Many of us have left the faith life for the fun life. Church, here's what I'm getting at. Skipping church will cost you something. Laying out a church will cost you something. Hey, skipping your prayer time over and over and over will cost you something. Hey, stop when you stop reading your Bible. Church, I, I could ask, I guarantee you, 95% of people sitting here would say they're Christian. And, but here's my thing. Do you read your Bible? Do you pray? And is this the first time you've been in church this year? I, hey, when you answer those questions, according to Scripture, makes a huge deal. Because that's what Christians do. That Christians have a relationship with the Lord. When you skip those things, it costs you something. Revelation 2, 4, the angel of the Lord said this to the church at Ephesus. I have this one thing against you. And now before that, the angel had, had basically bragged on them. Man, you got all this going on. You're helping the poor. You're doing this and you're doing that. But I have this one thing against you. You have left your first love. Many of us are miserable, depressed, and unsatisfied and have lost our joy because we've left the precepts of God. Some of you have lost so much because you keep leaving what's right and you keep thinking that uh, you can replace it with what's bad and that you can make success out of sin. But I'm here to tell you it doesn't work that way. You will lose every time you leave those things. When you leave the concepts and the commands that God has given us, you lose, ladies and gentlemen. You lose every time. When you leave something, you lose something. Now listen to me. There's some of you that need to leave some things. You need to lose some things in your life. You need to let go of some things in your life. Because there's some things you need to lose. There's some things that need to be out of your life. It's causing you havoc. It's causing you depression and negativity. And you need to let it go. But sometimes we leave the wrong things. And when you do, you always lose something in the process. Number two. To get back what you lost, you've got to go back to what you left. To get back what you lost, you've got to go back to what you left. All of our main passages that we've read points to this principle of returning to God. And God told, told him every time, if, if I'm going to restore your resources, restore your, your life, restore my purpose, restore, you've got to return to me. Revelation 2, 4, remember, I, I, or, or 3, I told you that the, the angel had said to this church, there's one thing I, I have against you, you've left your first love. Well, he, he, the same angel continues in verse 5 and says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. What the angel was saying is this, if you want what you had, you got to go back to what you left. If you want what you had, you got to go back to what you left. I have people all the time, they come to me, man, I just, I wish I had the love of the Lord again. I, I was so excited when I first got saved. I had the joy of the Lord and, 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 and now I'm just so confused and unsatisfied. And I'm like, because you're not living right. You can't, you can't just avoid the commands of the Lord and, and try to have it both ways and expect the joy to fill your heart. If you want what you had, you got to go back to what you left. But here's the problem with most people. We want what we've lost 
but we're not willing to go back to what we left. We want it. We want that renewed thing again. But we're not willing to go back to what we've left behind. You can't have it both ways. We need to get back to trusting God to provide. We need to get back to loving church, man. Man, I heard a statistic. Over 60% of people who come to church don't even want to be here. And I'm like, God help us. We should enjoy church. You should enjoy getting up and looking forward to going and worshiping your king. Church, hey, it shouldn't be a dread to come and sit in the presence of the Lord and to sing his praises. Man, you should want to do that. You should be excited about it. We need to get back to enjoying God's presence. How in the world are you going to worship right? Are you going to fellowship right and serve right if you don't even like being in church? There's so many commands that we're called to do that involves being a part of the body of Christ. And if you don't enjoy that, how are you going to ever do them? You see, the re- that's why I harp on you so much about loving people and caring for people and, and lifting them up. Because there's so much, so much of God's plan has to do with being a part of the body of Christ. And there's a lot of people that won't come to church because they've already been to church. And they've seen what other people do when they come in. And when they make a mistake. And how the church shoots their wounded. But God help us. We need to be different than that. We need to love them ladies and gentlemen. We need to help them. We need to. Hey if they make a mistake. They should look forward to coming to church. So, so they know they have a support system. That can help them get back on their feet. That's what the church is all about. If somebody don't say amen, I might as well do it myself. Hey, we've got to take this stuff seriously. You can't expect to just keep going like you're going and expect things to change. You've got to go back to what you left. I don't know about you, but I want to see people set free. I like to see people overcome addictions. I I, I don't don't want to just keep going through the motions and expecting everything to stay the same. I'd like to start taking the Holy Spirit seriously and seeing people delivered and seeing people's lives changed and relationships mended and restored like it's supposed to be. Not through the world's power. Because the world just wants to defeat us and to take away everything that we've got. But we serve a God who wants to restore it back to us. Some of us just need to get back to taking God seriously. Need to come back to selling out to God instead of selling out to the world. Need to go back to enjoying our worship again. To to liking our time with God. Hey, I know you love God, but do you like Him? Because I, 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 I hear that stuff. You know, we like to say that about people. Hey, I love them, but I ain't got to like them. What does that mean? Do you treat God that way? Oh, you love him because he saved your soul, but you don't like him enough to come to church and spend time with him. Huh? Perhaps that's, that, that's how most of us treat God. We love him, but we don't like him. Man, I'd like us to get back to liking God again. To enjoying His presence. To looking forward to coming to church. God will give it back, ladies and gentlemen. Remember the prodigal son? Remember, man, he had it all, didn't he? He had, it, he, he had everything. And, and he left it all. And he left it all. I mean, he was set up. He he was going to inherit everything. I mean, it was just everything was set up for success and he left it all. Wanted to have it his way. What's interesting about the prodigal son is when he left, he didn't know what he lost. At first, at first he was living it up. 
He's drinking it up. He's partying. He's having fun. He's staying tore up from the floor up. And I mean, everything's just going great. And then finally, he realizes he screwed up. Finally, he realized what he lost. And you know what he did? Well, let me go find a friend that'll help me. Let me go, let me go read some self-help books how to get out of this pig pen. No, no, no. He went back to what he left. He went back to what he left. And when he did, the father was there waiting on him. He finally came to a census. And church, it's my prayer that you do too this morning. Perhaps somebody's listening today and Perhaps you're watching and you're in a tree stand or hotel, wherever you're at, and you're drinking it up because you're miserable. You're trying to wash away all the bad memories and all the things in your life because you're unsatisfied. I've come to tell you that you can come back and get what you've lost. Whatever the devil, whatever the world has stolen from you, you can go back To the Father and He'll give it back to you. He'll give it back to you. You know, I'm I'm about to close. I told you. It's 11.54. We had a schedule. Let let, let me close this. You know, David, there, there was a time. The Bible says David lost the Ark of the Covenant. The presence of God. He he lost it. He and fear had just gripped him so much. That he didn't understand how in the world he was going to get the Ark of the Covenant back home. So you know what he did? He left it behind at Obadidam's house. And and it's interesting that if you do your research and and notice that there was about 18 months there. Where where he was without the Ark of the the Covenant. No, No time in those 18 months did he write a psalm. The great psalm writer. The great song writer. None, no psalms at all were written during that 18 months. But finally when he got it, he wrote, he began to write again. When he went back to get what he lost. Perhaps you're sitting here this morning and there's no song. You know the songs, but there's no song in here. You've lost your excitement for God. You've lost your love for the Lord. You've lost your joy for Christian things. Man, I've just come to tell you this morning, man, God will give it back to you. God will give it back to you if you just go back to Him. Go back to Him. You see, before 2020 happens... You need to finish this year off properly. Before we hit 2020, you need to take care of business in 2019. Don't let it end without going back to what you left. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you.